Hey AP World History, I'm Missy, the Time Machine Teacher, and today we are starting on Unit 2 of the amazing review Race to a 5 to get you ready for the AP exam. If you are new here and that sounds like something you're interested in, make sure and subscribe and don't forget to hit that notification bell so that you don't miss a thing. All right, grab your notebooks, let's get going. Let's begin with some context for Unit 2. From 1200 to 1450, trade increases due to several things. The Crusades and the accessibility to technology and just generally the demand for luxury items increases. Therefore, trade also increases. We also discussed how religion and technology spread through the trade route and the cultural diffusion of religion and technology within those civilizations that they were carried to through the trade routes. So in unit two, we're going to pick up with the Silk Roads. There are several causes as to why the Silk Roads became such a popular trade network. The first one, of course, is the Crusades. Even though the Crusades were not successful in the Christians regaining the Holy Land, they were successful in that when the Christians came home from the Crusades, they brought with them items from the Middle East that people didn't even know existed. And once they knew it existed, the demand grew and therefore they needed a supply. Another cause of the Silk Road was the rise of new empires. When the Roman and Han empires fell, the Silk Road declined. However, it was revived during the Abbasid Empire and then revived even more during the Mongol Empire. They made it safer because they were basically governing the whole area and so there was consistency with the laws and the rules. Bandits were also punished and merchants were more respected under the Mongol rule. Improvements of technology also helped for the success of the Silk Road, especially improvements in the camel saddle because there were several deserts that needed to be crossed in order to make your way from China on the Silk Road, so camels were definitely a necessity. Along with these causes, there were also many effects of the Silk Road. One of those effects was that cities and oases rose up that were not there previously, such as Kashgar and Samarkand. These became hubs for merchants and trade. Another effect was the building of caravanserai. These were taverns or inns along the Silk Road, usually around 100 miles apart because that's how far a camel could go without needing water. And this is where the merchants would stop to rest for the evening. The word comes from Persian words and mixes caravan and palace together basically a place that your caravan could stop for the evening. Another effect of the Silk Road was a creation of a money economy. China had been using money for a long time. However, most other civilizations used bartering systems or trading systems, sometimes with cowrie shells or other items that had some sort of a value. Due to the Silk Road and traveling, money became kind of a hassle to carry around, especially metal coins. So the government came up with a credit system that was called flying cash. And basically you could deposit your money in one place and pick it up in another place. It was the early form of banks. Another effect of the Silk Road success was the increase in the demand and so therefore the supply had to increase as well. Now let's go into the Mongols. The Mongols live in clan-based groups on the eastern steppes of Asia. The women in the Mongolian society do have more rights than other societies at the time. For example, they were pretty much allowed to do whatever men could do. One of the most famous of all the Mongols was Genghis Khan. He's sometimes called Chinggis Khan because that is his original Mongol name. However, when the Europeans came along and translated it, it became Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan was originally born as Temujin and his father died when he was young. They were abandoned by their tribe and forced to live the nomadic life without a herd. Impossible, because nomads live off of their herd. They literally use everything from the herd in order to survive. And so he and his family were forced to hunt and gather for survival. To say that he had a rough childhood is definitely an understatement, because it was basically just a fight to survive. So he depended on his friends and he started building relationships in order to improve his life. His rise to power is astounding and involved betrayals and shifting alliances, military victories, accepting defeated armies into his own, and eventually uniting Mongolia and becoming 
Genghis Khan. At that time he had a huge army. They were all really good at horseback riding and they were great with weaponry and great fighters. So what do you do with a big army like that? Well, you start building your empire. He also taught his army different strategies of fighting. For example, they had one strategy where they would send in a small band of men. Those men would retreat, and as the enemy chased the retreating Mongolians, the real Mongolian army would be waiting in the wings to attack from behind. So it was kind of a way of surrounding the enemy, kind of a bait for drawing them in. They also used new weaponry such as catapults and attack walls. These strategies were very ruthless and oftentimes civilizations would surrender before the Mongols even arrived. Just knowing that the Mongols were coming, they knew they had better surrender because their reputation preceded them and people did not want to suffer at the hands of the Mongols. He started in 1209. By the time he was finished, he had conquered China, Korea, Central Asia, Russia, and the Islamic Middle East. He did have some setbacks though. He wasn't able to conquer Japan because of a tsunami that hit, and he also couldn't go any further than the Middle East because he was stopped by the Mamluks in Egypt. His success is attributed to the fact that he had a very strong army and good friends within his army. He also allowed conquered enemies to join forces with them. However, if you didn't surrender, you were not treated well. There are stories of how he killed leaders that are very gruesome. His reputation, as I told you before, preceded him. So many did surrender without a fight, but there were some who tried to fight. And in the end, it didn't work out well for most of them. Another thing that led to his success is that he allowed artisans and craftsmen to continue in places that he conquered. He supported commerce and he was also religiously tolerant. His leaders led by example and under his rule it's called Pax Mongolica, which basically means peaceful Mongolia. This is when the Silk Road became safer for trade. There are some differences in how the Mongols ruled, so this might be helpful if you ever have to write an essay on this. For example, in China, his grandson, Kublai Khan, ruled the Yan Dynasty. He kept the tax system and the postal system. However, he did get rid of the tribute system because the Mongols were outsiders to China and they didn't think that the tribute system was fair. Under Kublai Khan's rule, infrastructure and roads were built. Scholars and artisans were supported. He limits the death penalty and he also protects peasant lands from Mongol herds. The peasants appreciated that greatly. He practiced religious tolerance, which the Buddhists and Taoists really appreciated because under Chinese rule, they were not as respected due to Confucianism. The Chinese upper class resented the Mongol rule, however, because they didn't allow the Chinese to stay in government and they took away the civil service exam and allowed foreigners to rule. Some Mongol laws also discriminated against the upper class Chinese. Mongols also didn't assimilate into Chinese culture. One traveler that is a key witness to the Yan Dynasty was Marco Polo. He actually traveled to China during this time and he wrote extensively about it. Once he wrote about it, many didn't believe that he was actually telling the truth about how prosperous China was at the time. But remember, he's writing from the point of view of a merchant, so of course he's going to talk more about the commerce that's present there. In Persia, the Mongols ended the Abbasid Caliphate. Hugalu, the Mongol who fought there, was defeated by the Mamluks and not able to go any further. Unlike in the Yan Dynasty, the rulers in Persia did not protect the agricultural lands from the herds. And because the herds were stomping through the lands, it ruined the irrigation system that was set up in Persia. Previously, there had been underground tunnels that were used for irrigation, and that was destroyed by the herds. Unlike in China, he did allow Persians to continue to work for the government. The Mongols in Persia did convert to Islam, and after their conversion, they weren't as tolerant of non-Muslims. So Christians and Jews were discriminated against and sometimes persecuted. This is also a difference. In China, the Mongols did not convert to Asian religions. Also, some Mongols started farming and gave up their nomadic lifestyle. So they assimilated more in Persia than they did in China. In China, they continued their nomadic lifestyle. Another place that was a little bit different with some similarities 
was Russia. Before the Mongols came to Russia, it was a series of city-states run by princes. One of those was Kiev. When the Mongols came in, the princes refused to surrender, so the Mongols looted and raided Kiev and decided to make it their home base. Bantu ruled here, and he rules under the title the Golden Horde at that time. Russia didn't have a lot to offer the Mongols at this time. They much preferred to live their nomadic lifestyle on the steppes by the Black Sea. So that's where the Mongols went, and in exchange, they forced the Russian princes to pay them taxes. The Russian princes taxed the Russian peasants heavily in order to get the money to pay the Mongols. The Orthodox Church, however, did do well during this time because they were exempt from paying taxes. The Mongols did not assimilate into the culture of Russia. However, the princes did learn to centralize their government and run their military more efficiently from strategies learned from the Mongols. The Mongol presence there cut Russia off from the rest of Europe and therefore they formed their own unique culture. Culture. What the Mongols didn't know is that the Russian princes were collecting extra taxes and holding it back to build a Russian military, which would eventually rise up and kick the Mongols out of Russia. There are several long-term effects of the Mongols. First off, they built the largest empire in history. They revitalized trade under Pax Mongolica and made the Silk Road safer. They spread Islamic science to China, and paper eventually makes its way to Europe where the Gutenberg press is invented. One negative effect is the spread of the bubonic plague. It's believed to have spread from the Mongols, and in Europe it's so devastating that it basically ends feudalism and diminishes trade throughout that time. Another legacy that they left behind was how to centralize government, and many governments stole those ideas and put them into place even after the Mongols declined. The Europeans looked to the ways that the Mongols fought and eventually would change the way that they fought, no longer using heavy armor that the knights would wear because they realized they could move faster without it. And due to the Mongol siege weapons, they no longer built walled cities because they were no longer effective forms of protection. Moving on now to the Indian Ocean trade route. One cause of the rise of the Indian Ocean trade route is the expansion of Islam. That's connecting more cities, and those cities become trade centers from merchants. Increased demand for goods also expands this trade route. From India, they're getting high quality textiles and spices. Most of the spices come from Malaysia and Indonesia and pass through India on their way to Europe. From Africa, slaves, ivory, and gold. China exports porcelain and silk. And from Southwest Asia, horses, figs, and dates. There are several other items, of course, but these are the main ones. Another cause for the success of the Indian Ocean trade route is the increased use of slaves. In this case, slaves were taken from the eastern coast of Africa, and they usually were forced to work in the shipping industry or in seaports. Others were used as house servants. They did have a little bit more freedom than those who would be sent to America later on, However, they were still forced into labor. In Islamic communities, they were allowed to marry, and many were allowed to form communities within the Islamic community. Monsoon winds are also a key factor in the Indian Ocean trade route. You wanted to travel when the monsoon routes were in your favor, pushing you in the direction that you were going. Knowing when to travel was very important. Another cause that enabled the Indian Ocean trade route was the advancement of maritime technology, such as the astrolabe. It was improved upon by Muslim sailors, and it allowed them to navigate better. Also, latine sails, which were triangular sails that were able to catch the wind quickly. The growth of states like Malacca helped local governments collect more revenue from the trade network. For example, most government collected fees from those passing through their waters. The sultan of the area expanded his wealth so much that by 1400 he was also able to expand his empire. However, the Portuguese would eventually take this over in 1511 when they invade and conquered the area. There are several effects to the Indian Ocean trade route as well. One of those is called diasporic communities. Because of the monsoon winds, you had to travel when the wind was in your favor. So oftentimes, Arab merchants would travel towards India, and while they were waiting for the winds to switch the opposite direction, they would stay in these communities in India. 
sometimes even marrying Indian women. This results in more of a spread of religion. The reason why they're called diasporic communities is because diaspora basically means being spread out and away from your homeland. There are also long-term effects to the increase of trade. Those who were producing needed to be more efficient in order to increase the supply that they were producing. So sometimes the state would have to get involved in order to make sure they managed the efficiency. They also were involved in taxation, specifically taxing imports. Another effect was the creation of the Swahili city-states. They brought wealth to the eastern coast of Africa and increased the wealth so much, in fact, that they were able to build better mosques and buildings out of stone and more expensive resources versus mud and clay. Another effect is the transfer of culture. An example of this was the voyage of Zhang Ho under the Ming Dynasty. Seven voyages, in fact. His goal was to show how powerful and wealthy China was to the outside world. His fleet consisted of 300 ships and 28,000 people. He brought new markets to China and he came back with all sorts of exotic treasures. One voyage, he even brought back a giraffe. Some scholars didn't agree with this because they felt like outside influence would be bad for China. Some also didn't agree because of the cost of the voyage. And some just looked down on the outside world and didn't want any interaction with them. His voyages were eventually stopped by the next emperor. Moving on now to the Trans-Saharan trade route. Trans-Saharan trade route is known mostly for gold, ivory, and slaves. Mali, specifically the city named Timbuktu, becomes very wealthy through the Trans-Saharan trade route. The growth of trade causes a need for more of a centralized government. There was also a need for rulers to decide on a standard form of currency. Most used items such as cowrie shells, cloth. Rulers also needed to protect their area. So they used tax revenue to build their military for protection. Sundiata was Mali's founding ruler. His father died and upon his father's death, the enemies of his father came in and killed the royal family. They didn't kill him though because he was handicapped. However, against all odds, he learned to work past being crippled and he became a powerful warrior. He had been exiled, but soon returned with his own army and captured the throne from his enemies. Under his rule, Mali grew even more wealthy. Manza Musa is another example of a ruler who brought wealth to Mali. He is a devout Muslim and leads a pilgrimage to Mecca. On his way, he spends so much money that it causes inflation in some of the cities that he goes through. He becomes so rich off of the Trans-Saharan trade route that he is the richest man in the world. However, late in the 1400s, when Mansa Musa dies, the Songhai Kingdom replaces Mali as the leader in West Africa. Moving on to the next section about cultural consequences of connectivity. New religions often unified people and strengthened the leader's rule. And in some places, if used with native religions, and made a syncretic religion. One example of this is how Buddhism spread from East Asia to China. Once it reached China, it mixed with Taoism and formed several different kinds of Buddhism. Buddhism also influences China to start using the vernacular or the local language more in their writing rather than the formal language of the Confucian scholars. This makes it more accessible to normal people. Japan and Korea also adopt Buddhism. And another syncretic religion that happens is Neo-Confucianism, which blends rational thought with elements of Taoism and Buddhism. It was accepted in Japan, Vietnam, and Korea. Hinduism and Buddhism both spread to Southeast Asia, and there Buddhist priests sometimes advised kings, and you can still see elements of Buddhist and Hindu art that was present in the region during that time. The spread of Islam also makes a big effect, especially on Africa. In the Swahili area, the Swahili language forms, it's a mixture of Bantu and Arabic. In South Asia, Buddhists were upset with the corruption of the government, and so many of them were willing to convert to Islam. Islam was also appealing to Hindus because it rejected the caste system, and Islamic architecture blended in in that region as well. In Southeast Asia, the rulers of Java blended Islamic traditions with local traditions, as well as Confucian principles. Science and technology also spread through the trade routes, such as the astrolabe and the latine sails, 
which will eventually lead to more exploration in the Age of Exploration after 1450. Luckily, we have several travelers who documented their travels during this time frame. One such traveler was Ibn Battuta, who traveled for 30 years around the Muslim world. He was a devout Muslim and writes from the point of view of a Muslim traveler. He basically wanted to learn more about the Muslim people. We also talked about Marco Polo, who goes to China during the Yan Dynasty. He's writing from more of a business standpoint and talks a lot about commerce. He is also an outsider to China, whereas Ibn Battuta was Muslim himself, and so he wasn't considered as much of an outsider. Another traveler during this time is Marjorie Kemp. She actually took a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and she gives us the perspective of a woman during the medieval ages who was a part of the middle class. Remember, the point of view is super important to understanding the document, and when you're trying to figure out point of view, you ask yourself, who is the author, what do they believe, and why do they believe it? What outside the document makes them believe that? Marco Polo will be influenced by his love of commerce, and Ibn Battuta will be influenced by his religion. There were some effects on the environment during this time as well. Champa rice is a new form of rice in China that's drought resistant, flood resistant, and can yield two crops a year. It helps the growing population in China. It was also able to be grown on land that hadn't been used before. Bananas will be introduced to Africa from Indonesia, and bananas provide more nutrients to the Bantu diet, enabling them to go places where they couldn't have gone before because some places yams wouldn't grow, and that was the main staple of their diet. So to be able to replace the yams with the bananas, help them to be able to migrate to different places. New foods are also available along the trade routes that people had never tried before. There were some negative effects on the environment due to the increased demand of products, such as overgrazing, deforestation, which led to soil erosion, and the overuse of land, which will deplete it from its nutrients. Another big negative of the trade routes was the spread of disease, such as the Black Death, killed one third of Europe's population and ends feudalism. Now let's look at a comparison real quick of the economic exchange. There are definitely some similarities. For example, these trade routes are going to connect Africa, Europe, and Asia all together. The Silk Roads from China to Europe, Trans-Saharan trade route is in Northern Africa, and the, Ocean, and the Indian Ocean trade route connects India to Africa. They all had a similar purpose. There was a supply and a demand that these trade routes were fulfilling. They also had similar effects in causing the growth of cities and centralizing local governments to enforce tax and a standardization of currency. There were some obvious differences as well. The goods on the Silk Road, the Trans-Saharan and the Indian Ocean trade route were slightly different. The Silk Road is known for more luxury items, whereas Trans-Saharan is known for gold, slaves, and ivory, and the Indian trade route for spice and textiles. There were some overlaps in products, but in general, they were different. They also had a difference in transportation. Of course, the Indian Ocean trade route was by water, and the Silk Road and the Trans-Saharan were land, so they used more horses and camels. And another difference was the religions that spread through the trade routes. The Silk Road was mostly Buddhism, Neo-Confucianist, and Islamic. Trans-Saharan was mostly just Islamic, and the Indian Ocean trade route spread Buddhism, Neo-Confucianism, Christianity, as well as Islam. There is some change happening here, change over time, if you will. In the beginning, each region has a currency, but over time, they're going to shift to a more money economy based on gold or metal coins, which will eventually switch to flying cash and more of a bank-like system. Flying cash was the system they used where they could deposit money in one place and pick it up in another. There were some social aspects to the trade routes as well. More demand for products leads to more demand for labor. Over time, maritime trade will increase and overland trade will decrease. Large scale products also happen because there's more revenue coming into the empires and so they're able to use that money to build irrigation system, canals, and military defenses. The gender structures during this time were mostly patriarchal, except in the case of the Mongol women who had more freedom at the time. European women mostly worked as farmers and artisans, and in Southeast Asia, women worked in the marketplace and served in trade roles. So to wrap up Unit 2, trade and interconnectivity increases from 1200 to 1450, and the Mongols play an important role in all that's 
happening during this time period. And that's it for Unit 2. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure and do so and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a thing. Stick around for some outtakes. And Samar... Sam... Ha! Samarkand. Samarkand. So knowing... So knowing when... Luckily, we have several travelers who documented... Documented? And in Southeast Asia... And that's it for Unit 2. Thank you so much for walking. Walking?